So thank you for inviting me to paradise where there are all the brilliant people in the world. Last night I went swimming in the ocean. And then I went to Camarones restaurant and I had shrimp in pumpkin gelado. And uh, you know, when you come in, there's a cake of cachaça right there. You just take shots of cachaça, right? And you go in it, there's this brilliant conversation. Right? And all these extremely smart people. And one of them said, well, I like all this theory, but I'm very practical minded. I would like to know what we can do with uh, this theory. And so yesterday we talked about theory. Today we talk about application. What can we do with these kinds of uh, theories? So I uh, consult with uh, robotics labs on how to make smarter robots, on how to make it so that people in the field can do better negotiations when they're in cultures that they don't understand. Um, I work with the little red hen lab. Just type in red hen lab to Google and it will come up first. This is a vast corpus-based archive for the study of linguistics and multimodal communication. I'm the co-director of that. And we do it for the purpose of making better media, better natural language processing programs, and for studying the successes of media so that we might be able to change education. So all of those are applied. But here's the applied one we're going to talk about today. It's one I wrote a book on with Francis Doyle Thomas. Um, there's a second edition out about a year ago, two years ago. Now, this book is an application of cognitive science to how to communicate. Okay? That's what it's all about. And it begins with the uh, idea, as we discussed yesterday, that for ideas to be tractable for human beings, for people to be able to understand them, you need these tightly compressed blends that you can carry around with you. And then decompress to use to understand the things that are at vast scope across time, space, causation, and agency. So you compress lots of different things. I've only got a couple of them here. To tightly blended little ideas that you can hold on. So since I went swimming in the ocean yesterday, I'm going to give you one example of compression just to activate your mind. So I'm going to compress all compression into this so that you can hold on to it. This is a uh, practical minded application here. I'm um, Coast Guard certified as an advanced coastal navigator. And for those of you who don't sail boats, or don't go out on the sea, it's very hard to understand how difficult it is to navigate on the water. Things look very confused, you don't know the distances, you're going to make lots of mistakes, and you know, the boat is going to go down. So there's a lot riding on this, it's a very practical mining. Well, suppose, for example, you are out at sea, and you see a boat, or you, maybe you don't even know if it is a boat. Is it a cliff? Is it an island? Is it moving? Is it not? You don't know how far away it is, right? So you're looking at it, and what you want to know is, are you going to hit it? Are you going to have a collision? And this can be very important, because if you're driving a big boat, the boat may respond very slowly. When the aircraft carrier comes into the bay, it has to turn at just the right spot, Otherwise, it's going to run into all the restaurants on the other side of the bay. You don't have a lot of time. Also, you don't control the wind. You don't know if the wind is going to die. You don't know which way the wind will push you. So you have to make these decisions far in advance. Are you going to hit that boat? Well, one thing you can do is think, well, I'm going in a line. That's called your bearing, your course, and the other boat has a bearing on a course, and you can say, well, okay, if we're going to hit, it looks like this. We're going to collide, and that's a triangle. Now, how can I know if we have a triangle that's going to collide where we arrive at the same spot at the same time, right? Like the Buddhist monk. Well, here's how you do it. I'm now going to teach you how to do this wonderful thing. You're on your boat, pointed that way, and you set your head in one position, and you mark some spot on the gunnel or maybe the boom or whatever it is, and you look at that boat and you just stand there. Look at the boat. Don't move your head. And wait. 
And if the boat stays at the same spot in your field of vision, then you're going to hit. So do something. Now, if the boat is moving backward in your field of vision or forward in your field of vision, you're not going to hit. So you're fine. Right? This is called the gaze heuristic in two dimensions. People who play baseball use it in three dimensions to catch a fly ball, as Gerd Gegerenzer has analyzed. So this is your bearing, right? And notice that if, you're, if it stays in the same position, then this line right here stays at the same angle, see? And these are what we call congruent triangles, right? So what you're going to get is bang, or right? OK, now that's a compression. Let me point out, out there on the water, there's no triangle. Why is there no triangle? Because you don't know if you are going to meet. You don't know the distance to the boat. You don't know the lengths of the legs. This is not like geometry in high school. There's no real triangle out there on the water. When you go and look at the ocean, there's no triangle. And in fact, the triangle in your mind is actually an uncountable infinity of possible triangles. Moreover, you're not deluded. There's no shrinking triangle. There are just lots of different triangles. But we saw yesterday that you can take the analogies across these things and compress them to an identity. Now we've got one triangle. And the disanalogies and compress them to change. Now you have a shrinking triangle. Now, that shrinking triangle is what you want to avoid. If you have a shrinking triangle out on the water, you're going to hit. So do something. Don't try to teach that to a dog. Dogs are wonderful. They can be trained to go out to sea. They can smell things beautifully. But this is navigation that runs across space, time, causation, and agency. And you can hold on to this little compressed blend and use it to think about a collision that might be two and a half hours off. In fact, it's much more complicated than that because, of course, what you want to do is keep the shrinking triangle counterfactual you want a triangle that's different, that is where, you, where the lines cross are at different times. So you actually have a vast integration network. And this lets you navigate on the ocean. Right? And that's what life is like. To navigate through life, you have to have these compressed little blends that are at human scale that you can carry around. And that you can use to unpack, to understand things. Now, you all know this if you study music. There was a time when people didn't know about tonality, right? Now we teach it to kids, the fifth, the major third, the minor third, chords. Uh, all over the world, people learn that the major scale is uh, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That's two steps, one step, two steps, right? Two steps, two steps, one step, two step, two steps, two steps, one step. That gives you the natural scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, right? Everybody memorizes this. You get chord sequences and so on. And then think how complicated music is with these little compressions, right? This is the natural scale, major scale, major diatonic scale, and then it repeats. It does it really, right? That's a higher level of note. But we said, no, no, it repeats. You come back to do. You come back to C. You can use these little compressions. We have the idea of keys, the circle of fifths. Then we have other little compressions. We can get people to remember the circle of fifths. Fat cats go down alleys eating bread, right? Fat cats go down alleys eating bread. Kids all over the world memorize something like that. It's an acronym. From there, they get to the circle of, the fi of fifths. From that, they get to major diatonic scales and relative minors. From that, they get to keys, right? In fact, there's an even better one that gives you all of them. Here, it's uh, bead girls, or it goes the other way, uh, bead 
bead girls can't fight bead girls. Then you get the whole circle of fits, right? And uh, you've seen all these kinds of things, those that have, of you who have studied music. These are compressions. You, you want to remember the strings on a guitar? Uh, Eddie ate dynamite. Goodbye, Eddie. Right? This is an E, that's an A, that's a D string, that's a G string, that's a B string, and that's an E string. Now, here's an example of one of these compressions for understanding your life and why you should educate uh, people. Joey, Katie, and Todd will be performing your bypass. Now, these are a bunch of 10-year-olds, right? And they're in an operating theater, dressed like surgeons, cardiologists, cardiosurgeons. And they're about to cut into this guy. Now, of course, they're looking at you, so interestingly, the decompression, you're sort of on the table, but you're also here. It's fine, you can be in two places at once. Now, this is not reality. The one place you will never see 10-year-olds, ever, the one place, is dressed up like surgeons in a surgical theater, ready to cut into someone. That's not going to happen. Well, why are they doing this? They want you to understand that these children need to be educated. They're going to be cutting your heart open later. right? So you better educate them, otherwise they're going to kill you. right? And but that's 20 years from now. Who can think 20 years from now? Oh, that's later. Worry about health later. No, no. They compress Katie, Joey, and Todd when they're adults with the Katie and Joey and Todd when they're 10 year olds to get you to understand it's the same people. And there's a causality. And we have to educate them now. And the language says the same kind of thing. Before you know it, it's actually 20 years, but it's a time compression. Before you know it, these kids will be doctors, nurses, and medical technicians, possibly yours. They'll need an excellent grasp of laser technology, advanced computing, and molecular ge genetics. Unfortunately, very few American children are prepared to master such sophisticated subjects. I'm sure it's much better here in Brazil. If we want t children who can handle tomorrow's good jobs, now notice the time compression. Better, you only got overnight to teach them. You know, you better give them what they need in the next 10 minutes. Time compression. Then they're going to need blah, blah. So please give money to education. You understand in the United States, almost all education is private. Even the public universities only get about 8% of their funding from the state. Uh, it's an entirely different financial system. Okay, well, good communication needs compression too. Right? You need to give people compressed little ideas that they can carry around and used to unpack. And we're familiar with lots of these rhetorical forms and linguistic patterns. So I, we say something like, like father, like son. Now, like, like, parallel clauses indicating, I mean, the clauses here, or the phrases here are parallel. They have a similarity of form. But that's supposed to indicate the similarity between the people. So the Similarity of the form is being compressed with the similarity of the people. And you have you know, 20 years of causation compressed down to four words to tell you how to predict. Or something like uh, iconicity in language. Those of you who study linguistics know an awful lot about iconicity. Iconicity is a wonderful way in which the, fo the compressed form can be used to indicate something about the meaning and help you hold it in in time. As Pope said, the sound must be an echo to the sense, um, a motif in, uh, in music, for instance, a little light motif, so you understand that the same characters back on stage, bomb, 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 right? Ah, you've got it. In come the imperial stormtroopers. Um, Aristotle talks about how you can unify a tragedy by using certain kind of unities, right? These compressions. So you're all familiar with this kind of stuff. Here's one for all of life. Right? What is life? Well, it's a choice. What choice? Fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. 
So there you are. The poem rhymes, it's fire and ice, all of life is compressed down to these two forces. Fire and ice, uh, you get the same kinds of compressions in Dante, and in fact, you get it in Twilight. So in Eclipse, here's fire and ice, right? Uh, this is ice and that's fire, right? And she's got to choose between them, right? And of course, they disagree with each other. They're now, <clears throat> Lillian said that everybody gets compressions. The thing to work on is the decompressions, because the compressions you get for free. This is what we do. Human cognition is built for compression across things that shouldn't go together, but do, to give you great ideas. It's mostly conservative. Most of what you're putting together in a great idea is very, very old. But there can be a little bit of emergent structure in there. That's the source of innovation. And so, to connect to this morning, take something like the idea that there's a creator, an intelligent designer. Well, when you look at this spider web, and we saw these spiders spinning these webs this morning, for anything that you know that really works, that's complicated, a, a watch, a computer, hat that keeps the sun off, fits my head and is not too big, you know, a cup to hold water. For anything complicated that works, that performs, you know somebody designed it, or some teams of people designed it. So it's actually a very, very brilliant and natural compression to say, wow, look at that. Somebody must have designed it. And then you have a compression. What's going on here? This is evidence of the creator or of intelligence design or something like this. You know, other animals don't do that. We do it. It's brilliant. It's not stupid. It's brilliant. It's just wrong. It turns out to be wrong. But in order to understand that it's wrong, you have to work in the vast decompression. You have to decompress this and realize what's going on. So for instance, in evolution, you very frequently get science presentations about evolution that give you these compressions because they're trying to get you to understand. So here is the North American pronghorn. This thing runs absurdly fast. It's a little speed demon. Zing! So the predators come after it, and they're you know, trying to get it and everything, and it just, zing, gone. Right? It's so fast. It makes the predators look absurd, ludicrous. It's like Wiley Coyote and the road, Roadrunner or something. But that's a problem. Why would evolution, to anthropomorphize revolution, uh, evolution, right? Why would evolution have spent all the cost to put that kind of speed in when it was not needed? There's no extra benefit. Well, the answer is that there used to be predators that were that fast. Right? So how does the science times put it? Um, the scientists, these are the evolution scientists saying that the pronghorn runs as fast as it does because it is being chased by ghosts. The ghosts of predators past. As researchers begin to look, such ghosts appear to be ever more in evidence with studies of other species showing that even when predators have been gone for hundreds of thousands of years, their prey may not have forgotten them. So why does it run so fast? Because it used to. Now notice all the compression. Thousands of pronghorns over time. They change. Natural selection selects. You get very fast, some very fast pronghorns. And we say things like, the pronghorn got faster. Where's this pronghorn? That's a compression to a species. No pronghorn got faster. Some were born able to develop more speed. They're faster than their predecessors. But they didn't get faster. That's a compression, right? Analogy, disanalogy, change. Moreover. What they're doing now is not actually remembering. They don't remember those predators that were here. And 
in part of the conversation, it's that these predators taught, taught the pronghorn to run so fast, that it learned to run. Right? Now, in the decompression, all of this intentionality, learning, changing, remembering is false. Right? It's false for understanding how the complexity of evolution and natural selection. But the important thing, as you say, is to have the compression so you can remember it and work from it. But also to be able to decompress. It takes, it takes work to decompress. So there are lots of these. This is from a kid's book, zoo book. This is about dinosaurs turning into birds. Now, dinosaurs didn't actually turn into birds. We can talk about the evolution sometime if you want the actual details. It's much more complicated than that. But see here this dinosaur? Notice that it's on one track. There's one dinosaur. The, the shadows that are being cast sort of suggest the light's always coming from the same thing. It's trying to catch this uh, dragonfly. It wants to catch this dragonfly, but it can't. Well, if I just grow some feathers and get to the point that I can fly, then I can escape the dragon. Then I can escape the dinosaur, and that's that's what happens. This this or pardon me. If I just get some feathers, then I can catch the dragonfly. So it develops feathers, it gets to where it can fly, and then it catches the dragonfly. Right. So intentionality, compression to one thing. It's on one track. Now up here, in what we actually have to think about. In the decompression, no, they're just a bunch of different dinosaurs. That's, that's the story. And there are analogies and disanalogies across the dinosaurs. We compress that to, to identity. There's the dinosaur and change for the identity. The dinosaur changed into birds. Right? It's a very easy thing for human beings to understand. Because like intelligent design or something changing, you know, I, I empty the cup. Here's my glass of water I keep drinking, and it's changed. The water is gone now, right? Very easy for us to understand. And down here, you get change, uniqueness, and intentionality. But you have to decompress that to go back up to understand natural selection. The problem is, the problem in teaching is not that people don't have compressions. They do. They just often have the ones you don't want them to have. It's not that easy just to replace them. Human thought is very conservative. My favorite book when I was an undergraduate, this will tell you how geeky I was. When I was an undergraduate, my first two degrees were in mathematics. It was called Counterexamples in Mathematics. Counterexamples in Mathematics. Little book, beautiful little book. It was like poetry to me. And essentially, what it said is, as a working mathematician, there are lots of things that you're going to think are true. You're going to have this mathematical idea, and you're going to use it all the time. And mostly, it's going to be really useful to you. But in fact, it's wrong. There are cases where it's wrong. There are counterexamples. You're going to think this theorem is true, but it's not. There's a counterexample. And so it was like running your finances, but every now and then auditing it. Right? You, you do the math, but every now and then you decompress and get back up and remember, no, no, that compression, good as it is isn't actually completely thoroughly right. We have to fix it. So here's another science compression. It's from Al Gore in his movie, An Inconvenient Truth. So now we're trying to communicate not so much about evolution, although that's involved. We're trying to communicate about climate change. Right? So there's Al Gore in his movie. He says, hi, I used to be the next president of the United States. And um, <clears throat> he shows you a picture of the Earth. It's right here. It's a pale blue dot in the Milky Way. Here is a uh, magnification of the pale blue dot. That picture was made famous by Carl Sagan. And Al Gore says to you, remember, he's a science communicator. Everything that has ever happened in all of human history has happened on that dot. Now, that's a spatial and temporal compression. Now, instead of the Earth being distended and, I don't know, four billion years old, 
all kinds of places you've never been to, like Natal. No, 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 it's a dot, spatial compression. And all time is now right there. He says, all the triumphs and tragedies, so everything, not just my life, your life, everybody's life, all groups, everything, all of evolution, all the triumphs and tragedies, all the wars, and the, all the famines, notice again the linguistic compression, triumphs and tragedies, which means the whole scale between them, wars and famines. All the major advances, that is what is at stake, our ability to live on planet Earth, to have a future as a civilization. Now notice, by the way, civilization is one thing, and it can have a life and a future, right? down to this compression. And then he concludes the film with this one. This is how he concludes the film. He says, future generations may well have occasion to ask themselves, what were our parents thinking? Why didn't they wake up when they had the chance? We have to hear that question from them now. Okay, now, in the blend, in the compressed blend, I'm a parent, and my children are telling me I failed them. Daddy, why did you screw up? Why did you let me down? Okay, now that's a very powerful human scene. Your children are telling you that you failed them. And they're doing it in language you can understand. In my case, they're doing it in English, not in Portuguese, right? Now notice, what we're really talking about are generations I and you will never see. They're all over the world. We're not talking about them asking you questions. Maybe they're thinking, maybe they're writing in papers, maybe they're not even going to know us, right? That's what we're really talking about. And they're not my children. And they're not your children. And we're not their parents. In fact, the blend works for you even if you don't have children. Suddenly in the blend, you have children. Right? That's emergent meaning. Not only, I mean, you're sitting here drinking your caparina, but guess what? Now in the blend, you have children and you failed them. Right? Okay. That's really motivational. Right? You can, what Gore wants you to do is to act globally across time, space, causation, and agency. And the way he does it is by, or tries to do it, is making a compression to a human scale scene in which you're having a conversation with people you care about. That's what you're supposed to remember, right? By the way, they're probably speaking languages we don't understand either. They're all over the globe. The difference between the decompressed network that you're trying to hold on to and the compression that makes it possible for you, for you to hold on to it. It's that kind of compression where people are talking to each other that I want to talk about today. And I wrote about it, as I said, with Francis Noel Thomas in this book, Clear and Simple as the Truth, writing classic prose. And uh, the analysis that is in that book about how to do certain kinds of science technology communication is, uh, is getting a little, becoming a little more popular. Let me show you uh, Steve Pinker, who's a acquaintance of mine, um, has just published a book. Yeah, he just published a book. Uh, yeah, just, just, yeah, you saw the lecture. So uh, can I move this? Over here, or over here, there we go. That might work. Yeah, he's just published this uh, book, The Sense of Style, which is about science and technology communication. So let's see if this works for just a second. Let me start with a model of prose communication. Uh, this is really, the, ought to be the starting point, because good style should not be an afterthought implemented as a final polishing. That is, you write something, then you go back and you fix all the mistakes and you get a uh, good style. Rather, good style derives from a specific mental model of how written communication ought to work. What are you actually trying to accomplish when you, as we used to say, put pen to paper? 
Uh, and I'll rely on a, um, a model called classic style, a tacit model of prose communication. And I owe much to a wonderful book by Francis Noel uh, Thomas and uh, the, the uh, linguist Mark Turner uh, called Clear and Simple as the Truth. The model of prose communication behind classic style is what psychologists call joint attention. Okay. That is, the writer orients the reader. Good. So back we go to this. So this is the analysis that's in Clear and Simple is the Truth, writing classic prose. So let's talk just a little bit about joint attention. What I'm going to talk about today is compression of communication to a blend that's based on joint attention. And I'll talk to you about what joint attention is. Many of you will already know. What we say in the book is style is not a matter of where you put your commas or how long your sentences are. Those are surface features. And they may derive from a style, but they don't constitute a style. A style is a mental model of what's going on. And in one way to think of it, this is again a compression, is that a style is a consistent set of answers to a few questions. Like, what can we be known? What, what can you know? What kinds of things can we know? What is it possible to put into words? How adequate is language for what you know? Um, what's the relationship between thought and language? And who is the writer addressing and why? And what's the relationship between the writer and the reader? And what are the implied conditions of discourse? Now, there are many different styles that have been very effective in the history of the world, each of which is a consistent set of answers to these questions, often quite different answers. And we go through a bunch of them, plain style, reflexive style, practical style, contemplative style, romantic style, prophetic style, oratorical style, and so on. Right? Different, different kinds different sets of answers to these questions. Okay? And um, just to give you an idea of how they can vary, in classic style, the assumption, this, we don't believe this, of course. A style is not a creed. It's not a set of beliefs. It's a blend. It's a compression. It's something to get you rolling. It's something so we sort of know what we're doing here, right? Not a set of beliefs. The, the stance in classic style is that language is adequate to, talk, to thought. Anything you can think can be put into words. That's part of the style. It doesn't say that. A style doesn't say what, it, what its stance is. It just uses the stance. Whereas in romantic style, the idea is that you can try, you can make the effort to use language, but that language is ultimately fundamentally inadequate to truth. And this is why in romantic style, it's just fine to think, say things like, um, when I look upon you, thoughts come and I just can't speak. That's fine. That's a perfectly fine romantic style expression. Because in romantic style, language is never adequate to the complexity of human thought. It's a fine style, right? Classic style doesn't do anything like that. Classic style has a different answer. So let's look at classic style. Its basis is classic joint attention, studied by people like Michael Tomasello, lots and lots of developmental psychologists. We're really good at Joint attention. Joint attention is when some people are paying attention to the same thing, and they know they are. And they know that by paying attention to the same thing, that they are interacting with each other. And that that other person knows that I know this. And I know that that other person knows that I know this. And on and on and on, all the way up. Right? You don't actually have to be communicating in joint attention. Um, I call classic joint attention, joint attention where you just have two or a few people in the same environment, like this one, 
although this isn't quite classic joint attention because I'm being the speaker and you're being the quiet audience. Right? And you're pointing out something in perceptual fields that somebody can see. So, for instance, I say, that light's pretty bright. Now, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, we know we're interacting, we know what we're talking about. He can see it, I can see it. That's classic joint attention. Or if you're out in the field, you say something like, that blackbird on the tree limb by the hedge has a small red stripe on each wing. And the assumption there is that we're together, there's a ground, I know you, you know me. The reason that I, my, my motive is truth. Again, this is not a belief or a creed, it's just a stance. Why am I saying this to you? Because it's true and I want you to recognize it. That's it. And my purpose is presentation. I don't want to sell you something. I don't want to seduce you. I don't need anything from you. I'm not trying to get money from you. The motive is truth, and the purpose is presentation. And I can know that that blackbird has a red wing. And you can verify it just by looking. And language is adequate for me to present it to you. It's a scene of classic joint attention. Lots of images that you instantly recognize as joint attention. The kid is pointing something out to you. You don't know what it is, but that's how you frame this. Human beings are spectacular at classic joint attention. A, a great deal of grammatical and linguistic structure is there to manage classic joint attention. Discourse management, getting you to look at things. Dictics. So here's classic joint attention in little kids. And uh, of course, joint attention like this, classic joint attention, has been analyzed again and again and again as a central capacity human beings have that makes it possible for them to learn, to get something and focus on something with somebody long enough, long enough to get it into backstage cognition. Consciousness is very weak very lame little read. You don't really want to do mathematics in consciousness. You might think you do, but you don't want to. You don't want to try to see in consciousness. It's much too weak. You have to get these things into backstage cognition, which is very powerful, right? And classic joint attention seems to be a great instrument for making it possible for you to learn something that you don't already know. That's how it's usually analyzed. Here are some adults learning things. Back to the surgical theater. This is a bunch of nurses in training looking at the surgical theater. They know they're all looking at this. They, all, they know they're jointly attending. They got not just parallel attention, not just group attention, but joint attention. And what I would say is, what about other species? Don't pack hunting dogs and chimpanzees that hunt and eat monkeys, don't they? Well, yes, they do for a few evolutionary activities. They've got instincts that look to us like joint attention. And they can really do those. They can bring down the ungulate and eat it. Right? But they can't use what they've got, move it off just like one degree and learn something else. I just taught you how to not hit a boat on the ocean. You were watching me. I taught it to you. You've got it. Shrinking triangle. You'll never forget. Right? You can't get these other species, even though they have some great coordinated instincts. You can't, the, the power is not flexible. You can't get them to use it on things other than the domains, the very narrowly scripted domains for which they have been built. So, um, and as I say, an awful lot of communication consists of constructions that are there to manage joint attention to try to tell you it's my turn, it's your turn, this is what we're looking at. And we have words like now, and you, and here, and I, and this, and that. And these are called dictics or indexicals. And they depend upon the scene that we're in. If I say I, it means one thing. If you say I, it means something else. Same word, 
but who says it makes a big, big difference. Here, now, things like that. So in fact, I, uh, this, these things are combined into what cognitive linguists call the ground. A scene of communication has a ground. So we are me here, you, you know I have a viewpoint. I know you have a viewpoint. Your viewpoint is not the same as my viewpoint, but I can understand your viewpoint. In fact, I can kind of in imagination switch viewpoint with you. So here's what I'd like you to do right now. Right now, imagine you're me looking at you. Go ahead, do it. You're up here with my viewpoint. What do you see? You can do it. You can figure this out. You know, for instance, that that person is not going to see the thing that's coming in the door. Now, if the door were here, I think maybe they do see it. I can see both. But I know that one you're not going to see, that one you will. But if there's a sound, maybe you will have heard the sound. So we're very sophisticated about who's in the ground and what we can do and how to refer to it and what to point out and how to warn people. We make other species just look like they're standing still compared to the human flexibility of this kind of thing. Well, now, here's the deal. You can take classic joint attention and you can make a compressed blend for things that are not classic joint attention. Okay? You're talking on the telephone. You and the person you're with are not in the same ground. They can't see you. You can't point. But you can use your idea of classic joint attention and compress it with the complex network that you're actually in. And then you have a style. You have a way to proceed in communication. You're going to use the same kinds of instruments. And everybody has known this. It's all over the place. So think, for instance, of posters. Here was a World War II poster in the United States. It's in the National uh, it, History Museum, right? And so there's Hitler, right? You wanted people to stop. Remember Al Gore, don't use up the resources? Well, in this case, you wanted pe Americans not to use up the gasoline because somehow it was needed for the war effort. Now think about it. Think of the chain of causation. Some guy in the Midwest wearing a hat, not this hat, is driving. He's using up some gas. OK, so there's less gas in the tank, which means there's less gas in the pump, which means he has to buy more, which means there's some truck in Kansas that can't go as far, which means that some part doesn't get there as fast, which means, which means, which means, which means in some way, on the other side of the Atlantic, there's some kind of consequence for somebody in the war. Take all that causation and compress it right down. Take all of those people and compress them right down. Take all that time and space and compress it right down. What do you get in the blend? You're giving Hitler a ride. That's treason. Now, Hitler is, of course, not actually in the blend. So these shadows and these sketches and these reflections and footprints, they're often representation, uh, representations of something that has meaning in the blend, meaning in the compression, but is it actually there? It's like the decedent we talked about yesterday, a, a component that's mentally, intellectually meaningful and forceful, but it doesn't really have existence. Okay? And <clears throat> notice the blended joint attention. When you ride alone, who's this you? Who's this you? Where, what you? I know, when I say you, we know what's going on. I'm talking to Christina. But this poster says you. What it's doing is taking didactics from classic joint attention and bringing them into the blend. And now we have a word that means sort of anybody who's looking at this. And when is the moment of communication? Whenever anybody looks at this, who's this you? Notice, you don't have to be a Midwestern guy with a hat. Just like you don't have to have parents in the Al Gore. Okay. You know how to decompress from the blend. Maybe you don't even drive a car. But you know that those people who are doing it are doing a bad thing. They're helping out Hitler. Of course, you don't actually think that. You don't look, oh, wow, he's driving alone. Where's this little chalk sketch of Hitler? You know? you're, not, you're not confused. 
It's a compressed blend that lets you understand, carry, and it's using all of the classic joint attention. In the blend, somebody's talking to you. You're not confused. You don't actually think they know you. You don't actually think they know where you are. You don't actually think that they know the time. That's up here in the network, the decompressed network. Down in the blend, you're just in a scene of classic joint attention. They're talking to you. They use things like uh, imperatives. Join a car sharing club today. That's an implicit you. In English, of course, the imperative doesn't have to have the pronoun, right? Um, there are lots of prehistories of this. Books do it all the time. So there's a uh, book by Mark Twain called Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He also wrote one called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And the opening sentence is, you don't know about me without you've read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth, mainly. Okay, you know that this is a character talking, not the author. The author is, of course, Mark Twain, who is, of course, a pen name for Samuel Clemens. And this voice is, of course, Huck. And Huck thinks you agree with him. You're the implied reader. And of course you're going to agree with him. But of course, Mark Twain, the implied author, has an implied reader who's much shrewder than the implied reader that, that Huck Finn proposes. So we, are char we, Mark Twain's readers, are charmed, amused, thinking of the immature, junior, good character of Huckleberry Finn, no problem. But notice this huge network of stuff going on, but it's grounded in classic joint attention. Words like you come straight in. So now we have a scene of communication. It's blended classic joint attention because the network has lots of stuff in it, just like that network for we have to hear that question from them now or the network of the boats. The network has a lot of stuff in it, but the blend is compressed and intelligible. Um, just listen to all the songs that you've ever heard. Most of them use blended classic joint attention to hook you in. Pleased to meet you, hope you dance my name. But what you are Yeah, so the speaker assumes a role and talks about me and my, and is speaking to you, what's puzzling you. Now, you're in a scene of classic joint attention, but it's blended classic joint attention, and you're not confused. So what I'm saying here is joint attention, classic joint attention, is a powerful, familiar, scene of human communication, one that all children acquire, one that all languages equip for work. It's a thing you can rely on. Now, when you're in a scene that's not classic joint attention, what do you do? Well, classic style takes the scene of joint attention and blends it with the rest of the stuff to give a scene of blended classic joint attention so that that stuff that's hard to understand with all those agents and things like that can still be understood, still seem familiar still have a common style where truth can be known, language is adequate, the motive is truth, the purpose is presentation, where presentation is a window, not drawing to itself, where there's a symmetry between the two people communicating, where the writer is competent, or the speaker is competent, and the hearer is competent. It's a flattering style. Classic style takes the view that the next turn could be yours. We're just having a conversation. I, pre I present the blackbird to you, you present the ocean to me. Right? It's, a, it's a scene of familiar symmetry all over the place. So if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy, have some grace. Okay, this song famous all over the world. I was astonished to hear this morning 
some breathy woman doing a kind of cool jazz romantic cover. cover. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name, right? All over the world, people love this song. It's intelligible. You don't have to get somebody to work. You don't have to say, now we're going to learn. Now I'm going to explain to you something about, I don't know, mitochondria, and it's time for the Krebs cycle. No, no, people flock to scenes of blended classic joint attention, and they find them intelligible, right? If you want to persuade somebody, if you want to give them something memorable, put it into a scene of blended classic joint attention. I want you for the US Army. OK, classic joint attention, little recoup. There are two people, maybe three. They're paying attention to something that is directly percept perceptible. Thought precedes speech. So you take all this complicated stuff and classic joint attention, and you compress them. Now. Now, the thing you want to talk about might be complex numbers or incommensurability of irrational numbers with one. Can you see it? No. But you compress it with something like the blackbird or the lamp that you can actually see. Now, in the blend, we're talking about something. It's what we're attending to. right? And you take the stance that you can present you know, that the, the square root of two is irrational, as if you're pointing at a blackbird. It's something that the other people, the, the other person will see if you can just point them in the right direction, if you can just put in front of them what they need to see. There's, there's the blackbird. You can talk about copyright. You can talk about intellectual property. You can talk about the metaphase of a cell. You can talk about, talk about, talk about. You do it inside, this is how classic style works. You do it inside a scene of classic joint attention. Right? You assume that the language is good enough. Now, this actually gets used all over the place. I invite you to look at TV network news, which is all over. Most people now get their news not from the television, but from these screens. Or you know, the screen in the hotel lobby, or the sports bar, or the gym, or the airplane or, or whatever. They get it from the screens. And uh, vastly complicated stuff going on. And it didn't start off as a scene of blended classic joint attention. It started off with people like reading the newspaper. But they realized very quickly that it was good to have something like an anchor. Anchors don't usually exist in life. And now the anchor speaks to you, speaking to you directly. And you know the anchor. And the anchor is there to present. Now, of course, the anchor may be lying. The anchor may be there in the network. The anchor may be trying to sell you hair cream. The anchor you know, may not know what he or she's talking about. But down in the blend, you get utterances all the time. The anchor looks out of the screen and says, hi there, everybody. Welcome. Now, who's the everybody? What's the welcome and what's going on? All the, all, I'll, I'll give you just a couple examples of this. Joining me now, Scott Rasmussen, president of RasmussenReports.com and author of The People's Money. Also, Chris Steyerwall, our Fox News digital politics editor and host of Power Play on FoxNews.com. All right, guys, thank you both so much for being here. So, Scott, uh... Okay, right, where's the ground? The ground of cognitive linguistics, the viewpoint that I know, the, the, the anchor knows you share. Where's the now? Where's the here? She says, and she says things like, joining me now. You don't need new language. You don't need new terms, because they come down from the scene of classic joint attention. They get deployed differently. So I have an article. This is really hilarious. I've got an article with a bunch of Slavic linguists in uh, Russian linguistics, which is a top uh, journal. And I know five words of Russian. And they're the five words for here and now. Right? They did all the work on the, how Russian here and now gets used in the TV network news. And I did the stuff on English. You get slightly different uses of here and now, but it doesn't seem strange to people. It's familiar language. And she also says, thank you for being here. Where's this here? They're all in different places, and none of them knows where you are. But you understand this in the blend as a scene of classic joint attention. They're looking at you. See, it's irresistible. You can't not feel that they're looking at you. Of course, they're looking at a camera. It's got a little light, right? And 
another goofy thing, this is a new construction, you know that they can see each other. Now, in a real scene of classic joint attention, if somebody's standing right here, by the way, this is expression. This isn't really somebody else. You need to know that. This is a gesture. And we're both looking. As we welcome you all back to the early show, Renee Seiler, Harry Smith, Hannah Storm. Okay, you've heard the news. China's economy okay, is bigger than Japan's. A fatal crash involving a fire truck earlier this morning in the Riverside area. The fire truck was responding to a call at 7 this morning when it collided with a truck. This was the view from News Chopper 2. We saw the story unfolding live as breaking news on our CBS 2 News between 5 and 7 a.m. So I uh, says, you saw this live this morning as breaking news at 5 a.m. Remember, I don't get up at 5 a.m. I didn't see this. And you know that in the web. You know that. But down here, we're together in a scene of classic joint attention. I've got millions of these. And now you know the news of this Thursday, March the 20th, 2008. I'm Shepard Smith. Thanks for having us in. Thanks for having us in. Uh, all kinds of playful scenes. The point is, classic style uses as the basis of its style classic joint attention. And there it all is again. The speaker and the hearer are competent. The speaker is authentic. This might be false. The person you're talking to might not be very smart or very informed. Classic style takes the stance that if you don't know what the speaker knows, that's just an accident. You could. I mean, you don't know maybe Sanskrit, but you could have learned it. It's not a fail mental failure. It's just, it's just an accident. You might not have been in the 16th century, but that's just sort of an accident. You may not know things that the speaker knows, but you have the same kind of mind. You have a classic mind, and you're just as good. Now, we may know that that's crazy, but that's the way the style works. It also takes the view that you're interested. Of course you're interested. Classic style never goes into, you know, trying to persuade you to pay attention or to tell you why this is important, right? No. It just launches straight into the subject. Um, they recognize it in the same mental context, and this is context of their influence on one another. The motive is truth. Language is a window. It doesn't draw attention to itself. Uh, the scene is informal. It's not a formal official one. Now, people can switch styles. So there are often times that I go and I give a talk, and it's a room or an auditorium full of people, and in ceremonial or oratorical style, I thank the presenters, I thank the audience, I talk about how glad I am to be there and things like that. But at a certain point, you can switch into classic style. Right? You can come out of that style. The point is to know, to pay attention and to know that you're doing it. Um, truth is not contingent, truth is pure, the presentation is perfect, so you don't draw attention to how hard it was to write or speak, right? You, all the work is hidden. The classic stylist presents things directly and straight, and you will get them as if it just came out that way. That's just what they do. Now, of course, the product may be too refined to be the effect of spontaneous human cognition. But the stance is, it just comes out that way. Why? 
because the classic stylist has a trained mind, and so do you. In classic style, Descartes is a kind of saint of classic style. In classic style, human beings can know truth if they're rational. Now, human beings, unfortunately, want to have friends. They have sentiments. They're weak. They're vulnerable. They are prey to all the fog and filthy air of self-interest. But you can, you can cleanse your mind of that, at least for a little while. And then you can see the truth. And in classic style, the idea is that's, that's just what we do. So in the book, what we do is go through uh, a set of exercises. One part of the book is called the studio. And we take examples we take examples like this one here's a presentation of a person now the person's not here so it's not actually a scene of classic joint attention and it would probably take a lifetime of knowing this person to see this kind of truth it's not a scene of classic joint attention but the model is classic style. Madame de Chevreuse had sparkling intelligence, beauty, had sparkling intelligence, ambition, and beauty in plenty. She was flirtatious, lively, bold, enterprising. She used all her charms to push her projects to success, and she almost always brought disaster to those she encountered on her way. This is 17th century French classic style. Classic style can usually be recognized by a crisp onset. It just starts. And a crisp dismount. It's presented what it has. And it doesn't draw attention to itself. Right? This may have gone through many, many revisions. But it doesn't try to make a scene of how hard it was to write this. I don't have time to do it, but I can contrast it with other styles, very accomplished styles, in which you have a different stance. We then put people through a series of exercises. The book has exercises. So notice that, take something like inferences. I present the rocks to you. I get you to look at the rocks. And I say the banded rocks, now you can see the rocks and you can see that they're banded. The banded rocks are formed by sedimentation. Now that's an inference. That's a scientific inference. But I don't present it as an inference. I present it as something that's just there and you can see it. Any owner who recognized that sound would have the slipping fan belt and the roadster fixed. Those are all inferences. It doesn't mark them as inferences. Our struggling lemon tree, you can see the lemon tree. You can't see that it's struggling. That's an inference. You can't see that it needs less water and a little fertilizer. But those things are presented as sort of on the same scale as being able to see the lemon tree. And on and on and on and on and on. Um, judgments. The adorably playful sea otters in the bay are actually banging abalone open to eat them. Now, classic style sort of takes things like uh, it's, day, it's, it's daylight and chocolate tastes good as the same kind of thing. Doesn't, you know, it, they're just truth. And we're just going to present it to you, right? Of course chocolate tastes good. Right? Doesn't go into a lot of conversation and complexity about how those things came together. Predictions. These houses are future beach sculpture once the sandstone cliff gives way. Now, predictions are very complex things across time and space. Classic style blends them with what you can actually perceive. Now, no one's deluded. In the network, you know how complex these things are. But how is communication going to happen? How are people going to get the idea how are they going to be able to hold on to it so that then they can decompress and think about it? Well, this style presents a model of how to get through the door, of how to make the communication happen to begin with. Then you can talk about the nuances. Talking about the nuances isn't going to happen if people don't get the idea in the first place. Cultural knowledge. Despite indicating Episcopal dignity, a mitre makes all but the most regal bishops look ridiculous. Right? You have to have a cultural background to know that a mitre indicates Episcopal dignity, right? Or tea is the wine of China. 
It has, it even has some of wine's sacramental character. It would only be cultural knowledge that would let you know that wine has a sacramental role. And if you're not in that culture, you don't have it. But classic style just presents it as on the same level as the blackbird in the tree. So, memories of a conversation, your response to my suggestion two days ago that we go away for the weekend was unexpected. Now, this is a memory. This is not something you can see. This is a memory. Memories are also collapsed with things that are perceptible. So we go through the whole story here on give examples of classic style and point out that for the presentation of scientific and uh, technological information, classic style, there are other styles, right? You can have another mature style. But classic style is one extremely powerful, um, highly influential style for exactly this kind of communication about science, technology, and innovation. You can find not only the philosophy in the museum with lots of examples, but also the program for how to learn to write as a classic stylist in the book. You can find it contrasted with other kinds of styles. So this is an attempt to try to help people consider the style of their writing and whether the style of their writing is actually fitting the purposes that they have by giving them some cognitive scientific tools of blending, compression, classic joint attention, dictics, and dexicals to investigate just tools to think about the style that you're developing. It is not a book trying to tell you to write in classic style. On the contrary, classic style is very bad for certain kinds of things. Right? Other kinds of styles work better. And I'll leave you with one example. This comes from a field guide. Field guides almost always use classic style. So if you get the Audubon field guide to North American birds, I mean, there's a bird, right? You want to know what it is. It's a bird. It's got a picture of the bird. You look at the bird, and then it's going to present the bird to you. And it says, this is the northern shrike. Unusual among songbirds, shrikes prey on small birds and rodents, catching them with the bill and sometimes impaling them on thorns or barbed wire for storage. Like other northern birds that depend on rodent populations, the northern shrike movements are cyclical, becoming more abundant in the south when northern rodent populations are low. At times, they hunt from an open perch, where they sit motionless until prey appears. At other times, they hover in the air, ready to pounce on anything that moves. Scene of blended classic joint attention and the rest of the book goes through an awful lot of uh, proposals for how to use this style. Not a style we invented. It's been here since at least Thucydides. Many great writers use this style, the style of great power. And this is a book that it's applied. We want to be practical. Can we use cognitive science and what we know about cognitive science to do anything about giving people more power and thinking about style and communication for science, technology, and innovation. Thank you.